Is it right that MPs tonight chose to deny, deny prisoners the vote? I don't agree. The man who brought this case uh, to Strasbourg, uh, John Hurst, um, was sent to prison for bludgeoning an old lady to death. The European Court of Human Rights decided his human rights had been violated by not having the right to vote. I think he violated every imaginable right of the woman who he bludgeoned to death and he still isn't sorry for. I think... <laughs> I think that this... I think that this case, this case points to the terrible thing that is happening in Strasbourg, which is that activist judges uh, and, and ambulance-chasing lawyers are creating a situation where the ordinary human rights of ordinary people are routinely being trumped by the unordinary rights of people who have behaved appallingly in society. And I have to say there is one other reason why I think this is an important thing, which is that when David Cameron was asked about this at Prime Minister's Questions, he said that the idea that Strasbourg could force prisoner votes on this country made him feel physically sick. There is a serious democratic problem when something which has no support in the House of Commons, very little support, I think, in the country, and something which makes the Prime Minister sick is nevertheless forced on this country. So I think there's a second reason why this is a good thing, which is it has shown that our Parliament remains sovereign and can override and ignore decisions from Strasbourg. That is a very important precedent. And only an hour to do it in. Carl Belizaire, please. Uh, do you agree with David Cameron that multicultural, multiculturalism in the UK has failed? This is the speech that David Cameron made this week where he talked about the doctrine of state multiculturalism that had encouraged different cultures to live separate lives. We failed to provide a vision of society to which they feel they want to belong. And we've even tolerated segregated communities behaving in ways that run completely counter to our values. Douglas Murray. Yes, I think he was right. Um, and I think we should start this by just reminding ourselves what multiculturalism is not. Multiculturalism is not multiracialism. It isn't pluralism. Uh, for years, the multicultural policy has been able to glide along in part because of that misunderstanding. Because of the misunderstanding that when you talk about multiculturalism as a policy, what you're talking about is solely immigration or multiracialism or so on. Uh, it's allowed itself an incredible uh, easy ride, not least by the fact that this confusion has meant that any critic of multiculturalism has been immediately decried for years now as a racist what of some What do you kind. understand by multiculturalism? Multiculturalism in the way as a policy. Cameron described. As a policy, multiculturalism is the following. It is the idea that there is effectively no such thing as British society or British culture. There are simply different communities which you're born into. If, for instance, you're born into a community from an Asian background, you will be treated by government throughout your life as a member of the Asian community. If you're born into some other uh, a racial or, or religious grouping, you'll be regarded in that way. And that anything in that group could be different from what the norm in society goes on. Let me give one quick, quick example I gave in, in a, an article yesterday in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it's, it's been quite commonly known in recent years, for instance, that girls of Pakistani origin have, at the age of 16, been taken out of British schools and married to older men. Now, if a white girl of 16 over recent decades had been married against her will to some randy old pervert who wanted to have his way with her, the state would have stepped in. It would have rightly said that that was an outrage. But, lo and behold, 16-year-old girls of Asian origin disappearing from their schools, nobody wanted to mention it because it could be thought to be racist. The idea was that there are different values for different people in society, and there is nothing more divisive than that, and I'm glad that David Cameron has called time on it. Different values, different values for different people in society. Well, and it's um, time to in answer time. to the question, I think he's wrong. I don't agree with Douglas's definition uh, at all. Um, I believe, I'm, I believe I'm a product of multiculturalism, not just multiracialism. Uh, my father came to this country in 1966. He used to write lots of letters to newspapers with his views on the stories of the day, and he used to get dog litter through his uh, letterbox in response. Uh, that 45 years later, in my view, 45 years later, his son can sit here on Question Time with David Dimbleby and a Conservative minister and say that I'm a proud Briton and a proud Asian and a proud Muslim, I think is a testimony to the success of multiculturalism in this country, which is actually not... And, and, and on, on, on Douglas's point, point about 
anyone who goes against Monty Cutter is regarded as a racist. Uh, a, that's not true, but B, let's look at the reaction to David Cameron's speech. Uh, Nick Griffin said it was a provocative speech. When Nick Griffin says your speech is provocative, you know you're in trouble. The daughter of the leader, the daughter of the leader of the French National Front, Jean-Marie Le Pen, said she wanted to congratulate David Cameron on his speech. And the leader of the EDL in Luton said, he's saying what we're saying, he knows what his base is saying. So when I hear reactions like that, I do worry about such speeches. Well, what do you think he was getting at? What was he trying to say? Do you think he was, he was speaking in a way that he intended to appeal? I think he did. I think, the, and, and it's sad because, BNP? look, I'm quite critical oh. of David Cameron, but in 2007 he wrote an article in The Observer in which he said we can't bully people into Britishness, we have to inspire them, integration is a two-way street, it's not just about immigrant communities, it's about all of us. And that David Cameron disappeared. Four years right. later he turns up in Munich, right. of all places, to tell us oh, that we need this muscular <coughs> liberalism and to talk like Douglas about forced marriages. Sorry, how many people have forced marriages in this country? And show me which cultural group defends forced marriages and which government defends forced marriages. I've yet to come across right. a single one. Uh, I've been very lucky. I've lived and worked all over the world. And um, Britain is by far by far the most tolerant society I've ever come across. Okay. However, what I'm concerned about is that, I think um, Douglas was right, what seems to happen is when something is said, there are minority groups of growing vocal um, ability who will find offence in whatever you say and find a channel to get that offence um, shouted about. And, and that, I think, is part of the problem we've got now. But the, the bottom line is we are an incredibly tolerant society and we should be very, very proud of that. Yeah. Yeah. Jackie Smith. Douglas Murray, do you want to come back on what Mehdi Hassan said? Well, look, I mean, both of the sort of left-wing people on the panel tonight, Mehdi and Jackie Smith, if you can still call Labour members left-wing, but it, both of them have done the same thing the left always does on this. You try to have a discussion about the failure of multiculturalism, and you have the BNP thrown in by Mehdi. They're told, uh, well, the BNP member congratulated him, at least concede maybe all sorts of crazy and horrible and disgusting people can jump on a bandwagon without meaning that it's the wrong thing to have said. It, they, maybe they're just opportunists. I suspect they are. And Jackie then throws in the example of, uh, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the EDL. And thinks, do you really think, Jackie, that, that that was what David Cameron was aiming to do? I mean, a couple of, you know, hundred people no, marching in Luton does not mean the Prime Minister of Britain should not be making no, a speech about a very should... serious no, no, matter. No, I, I and this is the problem. The debate by the left is always attempted to be shut down by associating it with far-right extremist no, and racist groups no, instead no, of having no, a frank no, and no, no, honest no. discussion. I did not say that he shouldn't make the speech. And I said I thought the argument he made in the speech was right, and incidentally, it was a one, one that we had previously made. What I said was it would have been appropriate given that speech, to also say that when we're pr promoting shared British values against Islamist extremism, we should also do it against right And I think, I think you, can, you can belittle the idea of a couple of hundred extremists, but if you put yourself in the, in the shoes of a British Muslim in Luton or in other cities where the EDL have marched to live in fear of those groups, then I think they have a right for their Prime Minister not to go abroad to Germany and send them lectures from there on who isn't and isn't an extremist. Take a couple of points from our audience and then we'll go on to another question. Uh, the, the gentleman there, you sir. And you sir. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I agree with the gentleman who just said that uh, British is a very, Britain is a very tolerant society. Yes, it is very true. It's a very, very tolerant society. Sadly, the tolerance of this country has been abused by certain religious groups. And I completely agree with Douglas Murray when he said that Mr. Cameron has done the right thing. And I hope Mr. Cameron means business. Now, Mr. Cameron was making the speech in the context of terrorism. Mm. And what he was trying to convey a message was how we target uh, terrorism. Unfortunately, this country in the last 15 years has not addressed the root cause of terrorism. The root cause of terrorism is bad teaching in religious schools. And that rubbish. has to be addressed fundamentally. It's rubbish. Mm. You're saying rubbish. Mm. Rubbish. I mean, we, we, very, very briefly, we didn't get into this, but one of my other objections to David Cameron's speech is the idea, you want to give a speech on multiculturalism, give a speech on multiculturalism. You want to give a speech on counter-terrorism, give a speech on counter-terrorism. Don't pretend they're one and the same thing. Don't, in, don't offend our intelligence. Terrorism, terrorism is not a... Terrorism is not a cultural problem. Terrorism is a political problem. No, and it's so a religious problem as well. Thing. And it's a religious problem. In your as view, well. Douglas, no, it's in a, the it's view a of a lot problem. of people, including the people who carry out acts of terror, who say they do it in the name of religion. They, they, also, they also say they do it because of foreign policy, and you Absolutely. always ignore that but, bit, don't you, Douglas? No, I don't. When they say they do it because of Iraq.
you don't, you don't notice that. You need at least listen to the reason they say they Agreed. don't. Agreed. So I'm why didn't he talk about foreign policy I'm in his speech on Sunday? willing to talk about foreign policy, as would David Cameron be. Good. But, but you didn't. cannot but keep on pretending that there is no religious component to the terrorism, because there is. I thought you said it was cultural. No, it was just... Hold on. Wait a minute. Culture and religion is not Stick with religion. You're saying there is no religious component. I'm saying there is a religious component. Oh, I'm right, saying it's not right. a cultural component. Mm. The people who blew themselves up on the London Underground uh, were not people who couldn't speak English or didn't go to Absolutely, secular schools. Absolutely, that's the tragedy uh, of it. Well, that's then don't the say it's a cultural problem. problem. No, but you're don't pretend to, you know, they're forced marriage. Because maybe you're doing what they're doing. They you are in a forced marriage. speak at once. Nobody can hear. So let's have a little bit of order, shall we? Let's have a question, please, from Gemma Perlin. Could the introduction of democracy to Egypt have the effect of destabilizing the Middle East and lead to a string of anti-Western extremist Arab states in the region? Uh, the first thing is that, the, uh, to get back to the question, I mean, the issue of democracy across the region, uh, some of us have been arguing for many years that uh, Arab states, Muslim states, Muslim-majority countries have the same desire for democracy as the rest of the world. You used to hear people say about the Eastern Bloc, the Eastern Europeans can't cope with democracy. Lo and behold, they could. You used to hear it said about South America, the same thing. South Americans somehow can't cope with democracy. Lo and behold, they could. And the same thing is becoming clear across the Arab and Muslim world. The, uh, the Lebanese Druze leader Walid Jumblat said that the site in 2005 of Iraqis going to the polls for the first time would have in time a seismic effect in the region because people would not see their neighbours going to vote and not want that themselves. Now this is coming uh, sometime after most of us expected it but uh, there are obviously problems and it's, it's, it's naive to walk into this and ignore some of the problems within Egypt. Do you, do, you see, sorry, do you see Mubarak, as Mehdi Hassan said, as our person, the West's person in Egypt? No. I mean, or, or do you think that we should have... I think it's equally patronising to the people of Egypt to assume they have had no role in their own country. Uh, however, this, the West has had a very complex and I think uh, unfortunate, regrettable uh, situation in recent years of thinking that, the, that stability and the pursuit of stability in the region was the most important thing. That has come back to bite us again and again, not least in the rise in anti-Western feeling across the region. There is a problem though, and it has to be flagged up to go back to the question, which is the Brotherhood. The Brotherhood, if it didn't have Muslim in the name, would be being described at the moment as a fascist political party. It has its roots in fascism. It is an extremist organization. Its offshoot, the Hamas in the Gaza, when it got into power, uh, immediately killed its opposition and it hasn't had another election. It was just another one announced, July the 9th this year. There was meant to be another ele election in the Palestinian areas, the Hamas have said no. They are a one vote once political party. And we can't be as so naive because to the think. We can't. To no, 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 no. We cannot be so naive as to think that uh, the Brotherhood, if they came to power in Egypt, would be anything other than a disaster for the region. Well, the state do we have the right to intervene to prevent No, no, no. Let me, let me clarify this. So the following. It is very unwise for leaders like William Hague, David Cameron and Barack Obama to be saying who they would like to run Egypt. It's a choice for the Egyptian people and they should remain silent. But that does not mean that behind the scenes and elsewhere you cannot say that the government, whatever it is that comes in in Egypt, has to abide by, among other things, international norms, peace treaties, including the Treaty of Peace that has kept peace between Egypt and Israel for three decades now. And this is a very, very important thing, because if the Brotherhood comes in and says, as their leaders have said in recent days, that they will immediately block the Suez Canal and start a war with Israel, then we are collectively going to be, and the Middle so, East is going to be, in you, serious trouble. How can you, how can you order a new government to abide by a treaty made by Mubarak? Well, the, in the following way, between you say, Egypt and Israel. In the following when way, when you say you don't want to intervene in the made by Sadat, in the following way, by hmm. saying that uh, by using soft power, by encouraging the country to go in a certain way, by making it clear that for Egypt to become a normalised country, it has to have a right. normal government. None up there and in, not, the, uh, in the Czech uh, shirt, the blue Czech shirt. It's somebody with a striped shirt. Doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah I go think. On, then the big difference between Eastern Europe and the Middle East mm -hmm. is Islam. And some would say that Islam is not compatible with democracy. Okay. And, and tell that to the Indonesians. Yeah, Indonesia exactly. is the largest Muslim country in the world and is a democracy. 